Good evening, everybody. Um, so I, first of all, I want to apologize. I heard that uh, some people thought this started at 5 and it was at 5.30, so sorry for the hiccup there. Um, but I want to welcome you uh, to this presentation. I'm Aaron Fairbrook. I'm with the Sonoma Resource Conservation District. And we got some funding through uh, Sonoma County um, to do some work up in the Mark West watershed. We did uh, some 100 foot defensible space around homes, around 55 property owner homes that we're trying to finish up. And we also did a three mile shaded field break. But a part of that is um, some webinars for landowners. Uh, this one's about resilient landscaping. And um, I also just wanna thank uh, everybody. There's been a lot of people that put some tremendous effort um, into this whole project. Uh, the Upper Mark West Fire Safe Council, the Alpine Club, Friends of Mark West, um, Fireline Mitigation, Sonoma Ecology Center. We have the University uh, California Cooperative Extension, the Master Gardening Program, the Habitat <coughs> Corridor Project, and Fire Safe Sonoma. So thanks, everybody. And I'm going to disappear and hand it over to John. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this workshop, Resilient Landscaping Gardening in the Defensible Space Zone, is hosted by the Sonoma Resource Conservation District, as Erin described, and funded by a County of Sonoma Vegetation Management Grant. My name is John Kennedy. I'm a design and Im implementation project manager, a landscape designer with the Sonoma Ecology Center. And this workshop was created specifically for the Mark West community, although the wider community was invited as well. So I imagine we have some folks from, from outside of that area. Uh, at Sonoma Ecology Center, our mission is to work with the community to identify and lead actions that achieve and sustain ecological health in Sonoma. And I'm very happy to be the first of four panelists uh, on the subject of firewise and sustainable landscaping. Uh, the group will be made up mostly of a partnership that we have that I'll describe in a moment called the Resilient Landscapes Coalition. And we're also uh, joined um, by Jeff Lemelin, who's going to speak a little bit about home hardening. I'll direct your attention before I get started to uh, the subtitle really briefly, Garden as if life depends on it. This is a quote from uh, an author and professor of entomology named Doug Tallamy, um, who's referring to the importance here of supporting habitat in our home landscapes because our own uh, lives are so inextricably connected to the natural world around us. Okay, a couple of housekeeping um, items before uh, we get started in uh, uh, thoroughly. This is a webinar format, and so in that, uh, it differs from a regular Zoom meeting in that you do not have audio or video activated. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and within a few days, we will share with uh, everyone who has um, participated in this uh, webinar the links to see that video, to review it again, or to be able to share it with others that uh, were not uh, able to join us this evening. Uh, and then an uh, item about questions, you'll see in your, your bottom uh, bar that there, there is the option of chat, um, but there's also a question, uh, a Q&A box. If you would use that, please, for your questions, that would be great. Um, just questions can become very easily lost in the long string of chat. We'll use chat sometimes to communicate uh, with you with a little bit of an update or a link or something uh, of that nature. All right, um, the Resilient Landscapes Coalition was formed about three years ago when members of these four organizations joined together to provide education and resources to help landowners with their defensible space. Uh, about a year ago, we were awarded a grant from the county uh, to do workshops like this one for landowners, but also for landscape professionals, those who are doing landscape maintenance and design uh, and fire inspectors. And so um, this workshop kind of comes from that, but uh, is supported in the, for this particular um, program by, as we said, the, the Sonoma County, uh, I'm sorry, the Sonoma Resource Conservation District. So the members of the Resilient Landscapes Coalition are the Fire Safe Sonoma, uh, which has been very ably headed up by Roberta McIntyre, um, but she's joined now and we welcome Marika if she happens to be in the audience. Marika Ramsden is the new um, executive coordinator for Fire Safe Sonoma. Uh, another partner is, is the Habitat Corridor Project, which was created by April Owens to support um, the, the planting of native plants and, and landscape design uh, for around habitat. Uh, the Sonoma Ecology Center, uh, first of all, Ellie Inslee is on the board of directors and will join us in the panel with, to, uh, to help answer questions. 
Uh, Ellie was one of the founding members of the Resilient Landscapes Coalition, uh, a lifetime landscape architect and restoration specialist, um, and has really been a mentor for me. She's created a lot of the content in this presentation, uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to have been working with her for about a year now. Again, my name is John Kanegi. Uh, the fourth member of the partnership is the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County. That's uh, headed up by Mimi Enright, who will be one of our speakers, uh, and supported by Jennifer Roberts. We're also very pleased to have worked with fire agency folks, and we're delighted to have Jeff Limmel and volunteer battalion chief of the Sonoma County Fire District with us for this evening, uh, and he'll give a presentation. Uh, we vet our content through the lens of these fire folks, and the whole time we're learning a tremendous amount from each of them. Okay, a quick outline of uh, what this evening will look like. Uh, I'll go first and discuss fire, uh, the, sort of the fire context around this, uh, as well as eco, uh, ecology and sustainability. I'll be followed by Mimi, who will discuss design and maintenance principles, and April, who will give landscape design and planting examples. Uh, and then uh, Jeff Lemelin will discuss structural hardening in the wildfire, uh, wild land urban interface, the WUI. Uh, that should leave around 20 to 30 minutes for questions and answers and discussion. So we hope to have your questions uh, beginning to appear in the Q&A box. So here we see a lovely scene of a native herbaceous perennial called coral bells, uh, also known as hookara, growing in the shade of an oak canopy and providing uh, nectar in its flower shelter for insects and birds and other wildlife. And it's an example of the kind of landscape that we'd like to help you create. So we're talking about landscapes that have multiple benefits, not only fire safety, but also beauty and wildlife habitat. We sometimes talk about recovery of a forest after wildfire, as if fire is always a, a bad thing uh, that the forest has to recover from. And Sonoma Ecology Center has led many fire recovery walks uh, in the past few years. It's good to remember, though, that fire is a natural and a healthy part of many of our ecosystems in California. Now, the loss of a home or of loved ones is understandably very traumatic, not natural, not healthy. And some folks have responded to their deep concerns by clearing most of the vegetation from around their homes, which may result in problems of soil erosion, of the growth of weeds that become uh, fire problems in their own right, and certainly the loss of wildlife habitat. They might sometimes create a moonscape of just gravel and rocks and maybe a few succulents um, scattered through it. Uh, others will hesitate to do anything at all because they're unsure of what to do. So. That's where we can help. And this workshop is all about creating defensible space that is beautiful, sustainable, and biodiverse. So many of us live in this area because of its tremendous beauty, but we need to understand too that this is a land adapted to fire. The Mark West watershed is made up of mixed conifer and some oak woodlands that were tended by native people using fire as a tool to improve hunting, acorn harvest, desirable stands of plants for food and fiber. These plant communities and most of the U.S. West are fire adapted systems, but the combination of historic fire suppression along with climate change and its warmer and drier conditions, more intense winds, have brought uh, a number of catastrophic wildfires in recent years, as you know. Uh, while fire is part of a forest natural cycle and is part of a healthy forest ecosystem, these catastrophic wildfires are costly and traumatic for unprepared landowners, and we have to marry um, sensible, defensible space around our homes with forest management that may utilize fire where that's appropriate, but other management techniques where, where it isn't possible. These catastrophic, very large wildfires can not only shift species diversity in, uh, in the forest, but also have huge environmental impacts. When structures burn, uh, they release uh, pollutants to the air and the water from, from their various toxins. Uh, and there are tremendous environmental costs to rebuilding uh, a, a home or a community. So let's have a quick look at, um, at some of the fire history in our area. Um, if you're joining us on a, a smaller screen, I'll just point out, um, let me activate a laser pointer here. This is the city of Santa Rosa. So the, um, the Upper Mark West watershed would be this area to the, um, to the north and east. So you see a patchwork between 1935 and 2014, a sort of a patchwork of generally smaller wildfires, um, with the exception of some big ones, including the Hanley Fire of 1964. They're mostly in the range of 2,000 to 10,000 acres. But if we look at that same map, but now just looking at the years 2015 to 2020, 
then we see um, a very large area covered by some, um, some very, very large um, wildfires, including the Kincaid fire at around 76,000 acres, the Wallbridge fire, uh, 55,000 acres, the Glass fire recently at 67,500 acres. Okay, uh, let's look at a couple of maps of how um, our, our relationship with the wildlands uh, have changed and how that you know has an impact on fire. So we're looking at the at, at a two different views of the same uh, map, the same area from 1964 and in 2017. So let me point out just a couple of things to get you oriented. This area, this large red blob, is the city of Santa Rosa, and this one over here is Calistoga. So we're looking at a 1964 outline of the Hanley fire. So this purple outline is that fire. And you see that it has a very similar footprint to the 2017 Tubbs fire, again, from around north of Calistoga towards uh, the city of Santa Rosa. What the colors are showing are different housing densities in, in those, um, and, and during this time period of about 45, 50 years. So the red shows high density housing development, whereas the yellow is a low density housing development. Uh, and if you kind of focus on this area here, um, just to the north and east of the city of Santa Rosa, you see that it's you know, really, during those years, developed a great deal uh, more uh, housing development, both low density and, and high density. Um, so this expansion, what, we, what we, we call this the wildland urban interface, or the WUI, um, and what that brings are more ignitions. Often they're inadvertent, but with more people living there, there just tend to be more ignitions. Um, more loss of life and property, follows, there's the greater need to suppress fires when we have that much more occupation uh, of the, that wildland area. And then there's the added problem that the wildlife is, uh, the wildlife habitat is very much more fragmented, making it difficult for many plant and animal species to, to, to thrive and survive. Some would say that we need to avoid building more in the buoy. Uh, but regardless, now that we've got what we've got, it's our responsibility to take care of the land and, and our neighbors, both human and, uh, and, and wildlife. Okay, spend a, a few moments looking at uh, risk and fire hazard severity, and also talk a little bit about some defensible space regulations that uh, we should all be aware of. Uh, so considerations of risk run from a, a very broad regional level to a very com uh, community and personal level. And this map starts out that discussion looking at the broad landscape uh, elements. This is a CAL FIRE, fire hazard severity zone map for Sonoma County. And the colored parts uh, of it are the state responsible, uh, space state responsibility area, sort of the jurisdiction of CAL FIRE in a, in, in a fire protection sense. Whereas the white parts are um, our local responsibility uh, areas uh, by and large. Um, so the so Cal Fire has um, described its area in, in terms of fire severity with three zone um, um, indications. The yellow that you see on the map are moderate fire hazard severity zones, where the orange are high and the red are very high fire severity hazard zones. So if you look again here to, here is the city of Santa Rosa um, and this area to the north and, and uh, east of Santa Rosa would indicate the, uh, the Mark West watershed. And um, it's kind of dominated by mostly the, um, the high and the very high uh, fire hazard severity. Now, Sonoma County is working on a community wildfire protection plan, a CWPP. Um, you're probably familiar with that idea. The Mark, the Mark West area has, has one themselves. And even though they're still working on it, it's not a complete um, a plan yet there is already a lot of good information on their website about risk and about this kind of uh, fire hazard um, severity ind indications, uh, and you can easily find uh, that information by just googling the uh, googling Sonoma County CWPP. Uh, some regulations that um, that enter into this area of defensible space would be the State Code 4291, which um, relates to the state responsibility area or SRA. And it says that in a forest, shrub, or grass covered lands, uh, it requires 100 feet of defensible space uh, and a zero to five foot ember resistant zone. And it has some also addresses some additional requirements for the very high hazard zone. Uh, and then more locally, Sonoma County has ordinances around defensible space called Chapter 13A, uh, as well as the city of Santa Rosa having their own uh, requirements. 
uh, a little bit more about risk, um, we invite you and suggest that you ask yourself, what are the vegetation patterns in the broader landscape around your community and how do they contribute to potential fuel? So that's the kind of map that we were looking at in the last slide. But we can dial in uh, a little bit more to uh, a neighborhood and, and a real personal uh, level for your own property. So what are the resources and conditions in my neighborhood? For example, what's the housing density? What's the layout of streets? What uh, resources are there for fighting fires, fire hydrants and, and water supply? Uh, and then what are the conditions on your own property, including the topography? Does your home sit, for example, uh, mid slope? Is it at the top of the slope? Is it set back from the top of the slope, which would be sort of the best situation for a sloping property? Uh, has the house been assessed? Have home hardening practices been completed? And if so, what steps should be taken working now out into the landscape? And that's where we can uh, hopefully give you some ideas to work with. Ask yourself, what is your own personal perspective on risk? How, you, how do you balance risk and other factors such as sustainability, aesthetics, and home improvement costs? Um, now, you might ask, does, do the uh, regulations allow that sort of balancing of different priorities? Uh, and in fact, they do. This uh, Public Resources Code 4291, for example, that's the, the, the California one, uh, says the amount of fuel modification necessary in the defensible space shall consider the flammability of the structure as affected by building material, building standards, location, and type of vegetation. So there is allowance for making some different decisions uh, based on whether you have a, a house with wood siding, for example, or one with a brick or stucco siding that is, is a little bit less ignitable. So each individual must assess their own personal risk and tolerance, but keep in mind that your risk decisions do intersect with those of your neighbors. None of us uh, you know, live on an island here and uh, decisions uh, that we make do affect um, others in our community. Okay, um, Jeff will possibly speak to this uh, a bit, I believe he will. There are uh, three basic types of um, fire exposure to a structure during a wildfire event. And they're shown here in this graphic from the University of California. There's a, a ULR down at the bottom that describes this is from a, a very good publication called 8695 from the um, Department of uh, Ag and Natural Resources at the University of California. So the first one described there in the top left is radiant heat. This is when uh, heat from a, in this case, an, uh, 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 an outbuilding on the property, uh, the heat from that burning uh, causes enough heat to, to, ignite, the, um, to ignite the structure, uh, and that's possible. The second one is direct flame contact here. Uh, this would be similar to holding a lit match to a campfire, to the kindling of a campfire to get it to, to start. And so in, the, uh, in this context, it would be as if the, uh, the forest burned uh, up to right up to the property line to the landscape and and uh, and like in a domino sort of uh, effect uh, leads the flames right up to the house and causes uh, ignition that way. And then the third one shown down here in the middle bottom uh, is embers. The embers would be you know tiny flying uh, bits of uh, burning material from vegetation or from uh, a nearby structure that float through the air and often. Uh, wildfires occur during, during especially windy times, and these embers can travel quite a distance, uh, easily a quarter of a mile or half a mile, but even a mile or more. Uh, these embers then can land on any surface in the landscape or, or on the roof of the home, as often happens. If that roof um, is easily ignitable or if there are vents there that allow embers in, then fire can start there. Uh, roofs, of course, often have um, some debris on them, and it's imperative that uh, dried leaves and uh, pine noodles and other, other material is kept clean uh, off the roof during fire season. Uh, also, the embers can land on the landscape, and so we design and we think about landscapes in this context because embers are the primary source for um, uh, ignition of buildings during wildfires. So again, embers are the uh, greatest cause of structure ignition. I believe Jeff will have some interesting videos and things to see about how this, uh, how this looks in the real world. Bear in mind too that your house may be the greatest threat to your neighbor. So if, you're, if you allow your house to catch fire, then it's going to produce embers uh, and also radiant heat that might um, you know, cause that fire to spread in the community. 
Okay, let's shift a little bit into ecology and sustainability now. We have a, a great opportunity that we should take advantage of as we consider our home landscapes through the lens of fire resiliency. If we're making changes, we can design our gardens so that they can play an important role in restoring the ecological systems and, and encourage sustainability. So human development all over the country, indeed all over the world, has destroyed and fragmented much of our wildlands. This author that I referred to earlier, Doug Tallamy, um, that uh, entomologist, professor, author uh, of some really wonderful books, including books for, uh, for, for the layperson. I'm holding one here. It's called Bringing Nature to Home. Um, he opens that book with a statement that is uh, shown here at the bottom of this slide. For the first time in history, gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. So our gardens can provide critical and ecosystem services and habitat. Um, the, the, the upcoming presentations, including April's, will tell you more about this and why it can be relatively easy and really rewarding. I've enjoyed very much uh, creating a native uh, plant landscape um, on my property. Um, and, and there's just a lot that you can do and, and a lot that you can, a lot of places you can go with that. Uh, so ecosystem services can be provided in the defensible space in your home landscape. And they include such things as shade or basically air conditioning for the home, re reducing our reliance on fossil fuels for um, making the home comfortable. Aesthetics are many studies uh, that um, have found positive um, health and mental health benefits around having uh, street trees, parks, uh, beautiful landscapes around us. They enrich soil and hold it in place. Um, Well-designed defensible space areas can clean and manage stormwater. Uh, trees and other plants will sequester carbon and, and support um, uh, you know, climate resiliency. Uh, and a, a well-designed defensible space uh, area can support birds and other pollinators. They can contribute to biodiversity. And let's spend a little bit of time on that. Biodiversity is this sort of web of life that is above the ground, below ground, includes plants, animals, fungi, and microorganisms. And there, there are many, many connections to each other. Uh, an example would be uh, of a local biodiversity issue that you might be familiar with is the Western monarch butterfly, which we've heard a lot about in recent years. It's the population has declined tremendously since the 1980s, and only a couple thousand were counted in 2020, just two years ago, um, and they were considered to be possibly on the verge of extinction. Thankfully, many more were counted in 2021, but populations are still well below what they were a few decades ago. So insects are a great example because they're a foundation of many life systems. They're kind of that first level of uh, organism that are um, that depend on, very heavily on plants, which you know are, are the, the very basis of this web of life because they are the only things that can uh, you grab that sunlight and use that energy uh, to to grow. So insects not only pollinate a, a wide spectrum of plants, including many of those that we rely on for food, but Insects, again, really form that basis. So they're a food source for so many uh, other animals, certainly birds, also reptiles, amph amphibians, and many mammals. Uh, speaking of birds, National Public Radio reported recently of uh, a 2019 Cornell University study that found there are 3 billion fewer breeding birds now than in 1970, so about 25% less than, than there were uh, 50 years ago. So habitat loss and degradation are the biggest drivers for that. Growing native plants was the top recommendation based on that study. So our birds depend on insects for food and insects are just simply much more abundant on native plants than they are generally on introduced species. So how do we achieve uh, biodiversity? We'll have some specific examples coming up, but in some general terms, we want to choose native species. Again, native plants, plants that are from California, or ideally from uh, our area of California. You know, most of the time, uh, 70 to 80 percent is kind of a good goal. This allows us to, you know, have vegetable and fruit uh, gar vegetable gardens and, and fruit trees. It allows us to have some special, you know, plants that might be an heirloom uh, a plant, a uh, rose bush from uh, from mom's garden or grandmother grandma's garden. Um, but most of the time, if we can grow native species, uh, native pollinators will prefer them and that will just lead to, you know, greater uh, habitat all, all down the line. It is best to plant islands uh, of, of plants for bird and butterfly food and shelter, a single solitary plant 
um, will do much less than being able to group them together. And, and Mimi will describe how we can create sort of clusters or islands of plants and still be fire wise by having appropriate spacing. We want to use integrated pest management to reduce uh, use of uh, or eliminate a possible use of pesticides. Uh, and providing a water source is often a very important thing for many uh, bird and, and insect species. Uh, another way to support biodiversity is to take good care of oak trees. So oak trees are in our area and in most of the places where oak trees grow, they're what we consider a keystone species. A keystone species is one that has so many connections with other organisms that if you pull that keystone species out or if its population is reduced significantly, then really there are a lot of negative ramifications uh, from that all through the ecological systems. Um, so ways that we can um, take advantage of oak trees and other trees um, would be to protect them from traffic, from uh, irrigation, in the case of oak trees in particular, irrigation around their root system, um, compaction of soil or uh, any digging or excavation around its root system. Oak trees have a tremendously high food productivity. So they produce, of course, lots of acorns is what we think of first. There are birds or many mammals. That, um, that rely on those acorns, but also oak trees have a tremendous um, production of insects that use the tree, uh, caterpillars that eat the leaves, um, other insects that uh, overwinter, for example, in the bark or that are in the soil around the tree or, or associated with the roots, and all of these insects, spiders that eat them, are uh, an important, uh, critical, really food source for many uh, of our birds. Another way of keeping oak trees uh, happy and other plants as well is to allow some leaf litter where it's appropriate um, to support the health of the tree and also again provides habitat for many insects, uh, microorganisms. Um, leaf litter can be appropriate in certain seasons in certain places and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit later in the workshop. Uh, the timing of work that we do in the defensible space is also very important, especially if we're doing any sort of large scale uh, plant removal because of fire concerns um, uh, or even some uh, significant pruning. The timing is important because birds are nesting between or in the months of March to August. And so we want to time a lot of that sort of management that we might do to the other months, September through February, which coincides well with a lot of the sort of the horticultural um, uh, characteristics of, of many of our landscape plants. I'll touch on just a few more defensible space ecosystem services, uh, plants and, and associated landscapes can enrich soil and hold it in place, covering uh, a bank like this. They, uh, they absorb the impact of rainfall uh, so that soil is less uh, washed away and down towards uh, through the watershed to um, impact um, streams and rivers. There's also carbon sequestration that I'll touch on in a moment. Um, they encourage, uh, plants will encourage water to infiltrate by creating a good soil structure. Um, and, and all of this uh, does a lot to protect water quality. Speaking of, um, of keeping soil covered, this is sort of a composite of two different photographs. The larger one and, uh, on the right is where some uh, vegetation clearing took place. Maybe it was part of a fire, um, a vegetation management uh, program, but it left some, uh, some bare soil that is not only prone to erosion during winter rain, uh, but also is easily invaded by uh, exotic plants that may be you know, highly invasive and often uh, are very fire prone. The photo on the left shows uh, it's not this location, but overlaid. Um, it, you know, it gives you the sense of how, in this case, uh, uh, one of the species of broom plants from the Mediterranean um, it, highly invasive and, and again really contributes to, um, to fire risk. Sequestering carbon, so all plants um, of course grow by uh, capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, combining it uh, using water and, and nutrients from the soil uh, into carbohydrates and proteins that are part of their growth. That's how they make cells, that's how they grow larger. So all plants do this, but of course, bigger plants do it more. And so trees are, uh, are critical uh, for carbon sequestration. Not only are they a, a great store of carbon themselves, uh, but as leaves fall, as roots grow and slough off 
um, parts of the root system or cells from the roots, uh, a lot of carbon becomes stored in the soil. And in fact, soils are capable of holding even more carbon than the atmosphere and more than above ground plant parts and animal life combined. So it's really a tremendous uh, resource and important um, uh, uh, for our, our climate uh, situation. So a carbon sequestration requires a lot of healthy plants and healthy soils with diverse and active microbial communities. So speaking of, um, of, of active soil communities, soil and particularly topsoil, the top inches, uh, is made up of a complex network that includes plant roots, insects, fungi, and organic matter, which are supplied by falling leaves and organic mulch. So really a lot of benefits to be had from, from organic mulch. And it's good to keep soil covered with plants and mulch and leaf litter where that is appropriate. Again, in a firewise landscape, as we will uh, learn more about, it is not appropriate uh, everywhere, but it, it is certainly in certain places. We also want to return, retain and incorporate other forms of organic matter, compost and so forth, and avoid synthetic fertilizers. All right, this is uh, the last slide and then I'll turn it over to Mimi. Um, also, there's a lot of opportunity to conserve and manage water. We not only are in sort of a mega drought right now, but just given our summer dry climate, we always need to be thinking about water conservation. There's a lot of neat things we can do um, that have to do with the landscape. Uh, this photo on the left is a design by April Owens, uh, who will be speaking to you in a bit, uh, showing how water can be collected from you know, roof surfaces or other you know, drainage on the property, but kept on the property instead of getting it off and down the street to the nearest um, storm drain as quickly as possible. We want to try to keep it on our property where it can um, uh, uh, spread out, sink into the ground, and be stored as groundwater. Another way of capturing water is shown in the bottom right photo, which um, uh, would be to use tanks or barrels uh, to collect water, uh, rainwater from, from a roof, um, and then that water could be used for irrigation later in the season when we're no longer receiving um, precipitation. And then the photo above it is an idea that I'm particularly excited about and would like to get something started here in my own home. Uh, around this. This is to use gray water, to use the drainage water from uh, your laundry, from your washing machine. And instead of getting that into the sewer system and sort of lost to your property, uh, keep it uh, by diverting it to, um, to, again, sort of a rain garden or a way of, uh, of using that water for irrigation uh, of a garden or, or of, um, of native plants. If you're interested in these sorts of uh, ideas, there's a lot of great resources shown down here at the dailyacts.org um, website. Daily Acts is a, a local nonprofit that's doing a lot of work in sustainability. With that, I will turn it over to Mimi Enright, who is program manager for the UC Master Gardener program, and we'll be talking about design and maintenance principles. Thank you so much, and Mimi, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Give us a few minutes while we swap over on Screen sharing, everybody. Does that look good, John? Are you seeing my screen? Yes, that looks good. Perfect. Wonderful. Just a few logistics here to get myself oriented, y'all, and then I'll be good to go. Um, so thank you, John, for that amazing foundation um, uh, for uh, April and uh, Jeff and I to build upon. Um, I want to start off, uh, hopefully you are all familiar with uh, who Master Gardeners are, uh, what the Master Gardener program is about. I'm sorry, I'm still, we still work on some, still got some screen logistics to work out here just a bit, y'all. Um, so yeah, hopefully many of you are familiar with who the Master Gardeners are and, and what we do. Uh, we are trained agents of the University of California. And our mission is to extend the educational uh, research of the university to our community. And we do that with a focus on uh, those wonderful sustainable landscape principles that John just took us through as our core message. Uh, and our goal as the Resilient Landscapes Coalition and our partnership is to marry those sustainable landscape principles with the very all important firewise landscaping that we all know that we need to be uh, undertaking uh, here in Sonoma County as we move forward to the future. So I'm gonna be sharing some basic information with you about defensible space and design and maintenance opportunities you have to create a more firewise and sustainable landscape moving forward. Um, so really hoping to give you a framework for assessing your landscape um, with a firewise lens. 
So we have a lot of territory to cover in a very short amount of time. I'm going to try not to talk too fast to get through all my slides, but uh, I'm going to start off by doing a quick touch on some, um, some basic principles. Uh, then dive into a discussion of how to design your home, home landscape with fire in mind around your home or structures on your property in the defensible space zone. A quick review on mulch, uh, that's always a popular question. I already saw something in the chat. Uh, we'll be touching on mulch um, throughout the presentation, but then have some specific content directing, directed towards mulch. Then discuss ongoing maintenance, which is one of the most important aspects that we need to be doing to continue to keep our fire uh, properties as ready as we can before the next fire. So let's dive on in. Okay, so here's the bottom line, and I, I think all of the participants on this call, I'm sure, are well aware of this um, based on our experiences of successive um, wildfires since 2017. What you do to prepare your home and landscape for the next fire truly matters. We know what the truths are in this slide. Uh, your actions to prepare for the next wildfire really are key. We all know how hard our firefighters have worked to protect our homes and communities. Um, but given the scope of the wildfires that we've seen, we know that we can't assume that there will be a, a shiny red fire truck parked outside your home when fire comes. So attending this workshop is a really great first step, but uh, coming to the meeting isn't enough. Uh, we hope that out of this session, you're going to um, glean a few things to, to take forward, to take action in your own home landscape, and then can, can, can successively um, work on this uh, over the years. Um, so really hoping we help you get started with a few key tips to help uh, all of us be better prepared and um, for our homes, family and community and firefighters are all perhaps uh, a little more safe. Okay, I want to cover a few basics about fire and fuel, which are particularly important to the, um, the uh, context of our conversation today. So very basically, fire must have three elements in order to burn, and that is fuel, oxygen, and heat. And which of these elements can we control? Um, that's the fuel component of that equation. And really basically, fuel is anything that will burn, and uh, that means organic matter. That could be in our home landscapes, vegetation, uh, it could be the landscape mulch, woody mulch uh, in our landscapes. It could be fencing or decks, uh, lawn furniture, arbors. We really need to be assessing our landscapes um, with that lens of, um, of managing the fuel uh, for better preparation for future wildfires. So here are our basic firewise landscaping principles. So resilient landscape design is really about um, plant selection and plant placement. Overall garden design uh, with hardscape elements incorporated in and maintenance. And we hope that all of this is done with a lens of sustainability about um, talking about all those principles that John uh, reviewed in his presentation, retaining water on your property, conserving water and energy and uh, supporting wildlife and sequestering carbon. So I want to say that there is not scientific research to support all of our recommendations. Um, and I will be pointing out through the presentation where recommendations are specifically supported by scientific research. And also, as we go through uh, this presentation, um, any items you see highlighted in red uh, represent Sonoma County code requirements. Okay, let's start with um, uh, some other key basic foundational recommendations to help make your landscape more firewise. First of all, you want to make sure you're removing all dead or dying plants and branches and removing ladder fuels, and I'm going to touch on that in just a few minutes, on a regular and ongoing basis. You want to create islands of planting with non-combustible paths, um, such as gravel, uh, between those plantings to interrupt the path or the flow of fire. You want to avoid planting or mulching close to structures, and I'll get into that in some more detail. And then you want to make sure you're pruning tree limbs up at least six feet or one third the height of the tree up from uh, the ground plane. So there's a really compelling video from the Kincaid fire uh, where firefighters are trying to hold off the fire from moving into the town of Windsor. And the video clip shows wood fences burning and moving the fire to the house. So you want to make sure that you replace 
uh, any wood fence or gate that attaches your home. So that doesn't uh, provide a line of, um, line of transmission for the fire directly to your house where it would be ignited. And there's some really great alternatives in non-organic materials that can provide you screening or protection um, while also helping to preserve your views. And I want to point out that uh, this picture on the upper right, um, I took when we did a visit to the Mark West neighborhood um, in preparing for this workshop, and that's um, firefighter Jeff Lemelin's property, um, uh, where he's created a, a incredibly beautiful woven fence structure out of steel. Um, and so I think there's really striking um, design and aesthetic approaches we can take uh, as we move forward with alternative solutions to what we've historically used um, uh, in our home landscapes. So hopefully you're all familiar with the concept of ladder fuels. The goal is to reduce the possibility of having that fire move from the ground plane into the crown of trees. Uh, so you want to make sure you're avoiding planting shrubs under trees. If you do have a shrub under a tree, you want to make sure you're allowing at least three times the height of the shrub between the top of that shrub and the lowest tree limb. Uh, and again, uh, you want to make sure you're limbing up uh, all tree limbs at least six feet from the ground or one third the height of the tree. And then it's critical to continue to maintain that as it, as it grows. So let's turn to plant selection. Uh, it's really important to understand that all plants can burn. Um, and uh, it's also important to keep some considerations in mind when we're choosing plants for our landscape. You want to make sure you choose plants that will grow to a size that's appropriate for their location. So when you pick up that little four inch pot uh, with a plant at the nursery, you need to pay attention to what its mature size will be and where you're planting it in your landscape. And then you want to make sure you're locating plants where excess pruning is not required to maintain desired spacing. Think about if you're putting the plant somewhere where, where it will thrive. If it's a plant that prefers shade, are you putting it in full sun? Are you up for the maintenance that that plant will require? Is it invasive? John made reference in his presentation to, to broom, which is pretty, a pretty pervasive invasive plant here in Sonoma County. So you wanna make sure you're not planting um, the next broom that will spread to your neighbor's house and possibly create a fire threat. Um, and also you need to consider how a plant um, might change over its lifespan. And I think um, lavender is a great example. Uh, it's, it's pretty commonly used in many wine country landscapes. It starts out as herbaceous uh, and becomes more woody over time. So, you know, after being deeply enmeshed in this topic since 2017, I've really started to see a landscape through a different lens. And I think about how fire will move through the landscape around my home and how much fuel that might add to the fire and how I can better manage that. So I look at how much woody mass is there in my, uh, in my landscape. So for example, with that lens last winter, I cut back some larger salvias uh, that had become very woody. Uh, and I um, cut them uh, to just a couple inches from the ground and they grew back beautifully this spring um, with much more herbaceous um, stems uh, with less woody mass. So they will become woody again in a year or two and I will have to cut them back again. Um, but if you don't want to do that kind of regular maintenance, then plant selection for how a plant will change over time is a really important consideration as well. So it's important to recognize that overgrown, dense, or unmaintained vegetation really creates significant vulnerabilities in that it can enable the fire to burn to the home in several fire spread scenarios that John referenced. Under that green surface, uh, that plant may have a really highly combustible dead thatch layer, uh, particularly if the shrub is sheared regularly. So here's some work that one of our um, uh, coalition partners, Ellie, did at her property to remove some ladder fuels, um, in this case, managing an older juniper shrub below a tree. So on the lower left, well, the upper uh, left picture shows you the before. Uh, and on the lower left, the picture shows you cleanup work she did to the interior of that juniper shrub to clean out old dead branches and debris. And then on the right hand side, um, she shows you, it demonstrates how she's um, uh, pulled it back from the trunk of the tree um, and managed the height so that it three, that it, she's got that three times the height of that juniper shrub to the lowest tree limb. 
Okay, so we just discussed where plants are placed and how they were maintained and how that's more important than the type of plant selected. Uh, but it's particularly important to note that research, scientific research does recommend not planting in the following specific areas. In the zero to five foot zone around your home or structures, and I'm gonna go into that in some more detail in a few, in a few slides, under vents and eaves, in front of windows or combustible siding, under or near decks, and in those inside corners of houses. Um, it's very easy for an inside corner to track embers as they may be bombarding your house and they could easily ignite um, any uh, planted, any uh, organic material, planted material in that uh, corner of the house and transmit the flame to the home. Okay, so let's dive into the zones that make up the what we call the defensible space um, around your home and structures. So your starting point is your house. And um, I'm not gonna be addressing home hardening in my presentation today as our, our focus is on the landscape, but there are many wonderful resources out there and available to help guide you through uh, the home hardening process. But here are the dif different defensible space zones in your home landscape that we're gonna be discussing today. So after you've hardened your home, you then want to move out to that zero to five foot um, around your structures, then to the five to 30 foot perimeter around your structures, and then to 30 to 100 feet. So the first zone we'll discuss is zone zero, also called the ember defense zone. And this is really a relatively newer zone introduced into the defensible space recommendations. I do wanna stress that um, the Ember Defense Zone is supported by scientific research. Uh, so the objective of this zone is to, to reduce the chance of those windblown embers, right? The highest, highest risk of a fire threat to your, your home structure, to reduce the chance of those windblown embers from a fire landing near the home and igniting combustible debris or materials. So this zone is closest to your house. So it really requires the most careful selection and management of vegetation and other possible fuels. So classically, we have massed shrubs against the house called foundation shrubs. So this is really a big shift away from how we have traditionally designed our home landscapes. But we really need to think about the fuel that that generates fire in immediate proximity to our house. Optimally, uh, there should be no combustible materials in this zone. Um, so at a minimum, you wanna remove or minimize planting in those more vulnerable spaces that we just discussed, where fire could enter your home, under the vents and eaves, in front of windows or combustible siding, and under or near decks or in those corners. Um, and again, no uh, fences or wood gates attached to the house, as this could directly move fire to your home. And that also applies to, um, to hedges. So from a maintenance perspective, you want to make sure that you're regularly removing any dead plant material in zone zero. And at a minimum, you want to make sure you're removing any debris in the zero to five foot zone on a red flag warning day or if you have time before evacuating from a fire. So as we've discussed during a wildfire, thousands of embers uh, can rain down on roofs and pelt the side of homes like hail during a rainstorm. Um, so if these embers become lodged in something easily ignited um, on or near a house, the home will be in jeopardy of burning. The leaves pile up in the same places every year. Uh, and the, the biggest problem uh, in this scenario would, not, uh, would be exposure, not of the, um, of the class, possibly class A roofing material, but of the, the vulnerable walls. So embers coming into, again, embers want to reinforce with you guys, embers coming into contact with flammable material is the major reason why homes are destroyed during wildfire. So we aren't suggesting that you have to remove trees if they're in the zero to five foot zone. Trees provide, as John referenced, really important shade during the summer to help reduce energy needs inside your home and provide many other um, uh, values and service, services. The most important aspect to consider with trees closer to your home is what debris they drop that you then need to maintain on your roof and in the zones immediately around the structures. So it can make your maintenance easier if you remove limbs within six feet of your roof. So during a red flag warning day, or if you have to evacuate from your house due to a fire, 
clean up that debris in this zone, in this zero to five foot zone around your structure or on your roof. For example, I have uh, an oak tree that's in my five to 30 foot zone, but that overhangs my zero to five foot zone. And year round, it drops twigs or acorns and leaves. So uh, I can, I'm cleaning that up year round, but for sure on a red flag warning day, I'm out there um, cleaning and removing that debris from that zero to five foot zone. And I wanna point out that it is a county code requirement to cut any tree limbs that are within 10 feet of a stove pipe or a chimney outlet, and you need to maintain that spacing year round. Okay, let's move on to zone one, the five to 30 foot zone. And this is commonly referred to as the home defense zone. So this is likely where firefighters will make a stand if they are working to defend your home from a wildfire. So keep this in mind to ensure that they have ease of access into this zone. The recommendation for this zone is to plant in islands that are separated by pathways. And in a higher risk area, you might wanna consider making those pathways non-combustible like uh, gravel or stone. The goal is to interrupt the flow of fire to your home. So optimally plantings in these zones should be herbaceous, not woody, and in, um, at three feet in height or less. You can inc consider inclusion of a shrub or trees, but optimally it would be maybe a specimen, a single individual shrub or tree rather than masses. Uh, and then you wanna make sure all plants are accessible for regular maintenance as you wanna keep all plants clear of any dead plant material. Uh, and this is a really great zone for um, hardscapes such as patios. So the basics in zone one from a design lens are uh, low growing, mostly perennial plants that are well maintained, considering inclusion of hardscape to break up your planted areas. Uh, in this picture, we have a Santa Rosa home with a dry creek bed. Uh, John showed a great picture of a, a dry creek bed from one of April's designs that, that helps break up the planted areas with hardscape, in this scape, uh, case, these stones making up the dry creek bed. Um, so this is a great use of hardscape in this five to 30 foot zone, and it also helps to retain water on the site in the soil, also a really important aspect from a landscape sustainability principle. In zone two, called the 30 to 100 foot zone or the reduced fuel zone, we have the same basic principles as the five to 30 foot zone, but you can include shrubs and trees in widely spaced groups. You wanna continue the focus on creating islands of vegetation, Continue making sure you have easy access for ongoing maintenance. Wider pathways in this zone can help facilitate that access. And you wanna of course continue your vigilance on ladder fuel removal and regularly removing any dead plant material. It is a county code requirement that annual grasses must be mowed to four inches in height during fire season. And you wanna make sure um, during fire season you are moving any wood piles to this zone. If you've brought them in closer to the house during the winter season for ease of access, you wanna move them out to this zone so there's, and make sure there's nothing combustible located near that pile. These are CAL FIRE recommendations for plant spacing guidelines within 100 feet of your home. I wanna stress that these are not mandated by law. Uh, these guidelines for spacing are due to flame height and are based on the slope of land around the home, which is a major consideration in assessing your wildfire risk. So a fire will burn faster and more intensely uphill than along flat ground. Uh, so a steeper slope will revolt, result in a faster moving fire with longer flame lengths. So this um, graphic is depicting shrub spacing. Low growing, well irrigated grasses or ground covers or perennials are accepted to be, considered to be acceptable between these plant groupings. Uh, but again, each of us needs to assess the overall risk, our overall individual risk um, uh, based on degree of slope and fire risk uh, to make appropriate decisions in our own home landscapes. Uh, this graphic is depicting suggested horizontal tree spacing as well as vertical separation, those ladder fuels we discussed earlier. Um, spacing on less than a 20% slope of 10 feet is recommended and on steeper slopes that recommended distance is increased. So again, we don't have to denude our landscapes in the 100 foot perimeter around our home, but we do want to make sure we have some spacing to reduce potential fuel volume and help uh, break up the flow of fire to home. Again, you want to make sure you've, you've done your own personal risk assessment. Are you in a very high fire severity zone? Are you directly abutting wildland? Uh, are you on a highly sloped property, then you might want to consider uh, your spacing requirements uh, given that personal risk assessment based on that. 
So I know it's difficult. It's easy to think of this in the context of a new landscape, uh, you know, starting from a blank slate. Um, this is a great East Bay mud graphic that shows before and after maintenance for an existing mature landscape. In the before, we see no break in the planted areas. Shrubs are massed up against the house. And after maintenance, you see islands of vegetation, shrubs next to the house removed, trees are limbed up and ladder fields removed, and uh, shrubs and trees are thinned. You also want to make sure that you have your, you, your family, and firefighters have clear access into and out of your property. Uh, what would you do to make this driveway more firewise? You'd make want to make sure you're cutting that grass to four inches in fire season, limbing up trees. The recommendation is to allow for 10 feet from the road edge or 15 feet vertically for passage of fire vehicles uh, and to make sure that you have 12 feet of unobstructed pavement for the passage of vehicles. And you would really want to follow the same manage vegetation management pr principles as we discussed in zone two. So once you've done the work to harden your home and prepare your defensible space, it's important to reach out and work with your neighbors, work together to develop a fuel reduction plan, watch for maintenance needed, and consider possible total volume of vegetation in your area and whether there are any ladder fuels. This is actually a shot from my zero to five foot zone. I live northeast of Cloverdale in a very high fire severity risk zone directly abutting wildlands. Looking across to my neighbor's property, which is within my 100 foot defensible space zone, um, my neighbor, um, but the whole a number of our immediate neighbors have done uh, extensive work up the hill in the wildland behind our homes to create that spacing that we've been discussing. Um, I'm not sure you can really see it clearly in this picture, but those are actually piles of brush waiting to be chipped in the free chipping program. So uh, many of us are working very hard in defensible space, especially in the context text of our risk factor. Um, it is an ongoing process and with all the maintenance needed every year and incremental improvements to make our homes and our neighborhood better prepared for future fires. If you reside in a more densely forested area, such as the Mark West um, area neighborhoods, this is a picture I took when we were out in the Mark West neighborhoods. You can um, control fire behavior by reducing those ladder fuels, opening up the canopy and maintaining ground fuels. We're not going to go into this in depth today. Um, but this certainly helps firefighters with fire suppression during a fire. Uh, but then because new vegetation will regenerate in these areas, re-entry into the stand is necessary every few years. Throughout the year, you need to continuously monitor um, for needed maintenance. Uh, it's a county code requirement to regularly remove any dead plants and branches from trees and shrubs. Uh, it is recommended to remove vines from trees and shrubs. Annually before season, uh, here are recommendations. Again, you want to um, mow your annual grasses and weeds to four inches tall or less. That is a county cut requirement. Cut back woody perennials and shrubs as needed to refresh and regenerate them. Thin any overgrown vegetation. Again, John did a really great job talking about considering the timing of your plant removals based on wildlife cycles. Uh, and again, you want to move your wood piles um, to 30, at least 30 feet from your buildings. Um, cover them with fire resistant tarps and clear surrounding vegetation during fire season, and that is a county code requirement. Then every few years is needed. You want to thin and reduce tree canopies to remove twiggy growth, maintain separation between your trees, and, and really keep an eye to reducing your overall fuel load. Uh, keep branches, uh, lowest branches of trees pruned up at least six feet from the ground. Cut back ground covers and vines to remove buildup of dry stems and dead leaves. I did this myself this uh, last fall. I had a, a native clematis on a fence that had gotten very woody and had a lot of dead leaves in the interior. And I find the easiest practice was to really cut it back hard uh, to about a foot from the ground. And it's regenerated really beautifully with fresh, um, th fresh vegetation this year. And you want to continue to cut back your shrubs to renew them. Okay, mulch. Mulch is a really important um, aspect in terms of helping us with weed suppression and water conservation. But wood mulches are organic and as such, they are combustible materials which can transmit fire. So it's recommended to not use mulch in a widespread or continuous manner. Um, again, the scientifically supported recommendation is for no organic mulch in the zero to five foot zone. So we've got some great examples from some homes in um, uh, Fountain Grove um, that have gravel or stone uh, directly uh, in that zero to five foot zone directly next to the, to the uh, structure. 
Composted wood chips demonstrated the least hazardous fire behavior uh, over um, uh, overall of eight mulch treatments that were tested in a study by the University of Nevada at Reno and the University of California. Um, as uh, I've, I've been made aware that there's a new study that's being done on mulch flammability. So really looking forward to some new scientific results uh, on mulch flammability coming out soon. Um, the recommendation is to use two to three inches of mulch in those islands of plantings that we talked about. In higher fire risk areas, you might wanna consider separating mulched areas with non-combustible and ignition resistant materials such as concrete gravel or rock, or maybe even a native grass lawn. Uh, in your five to uh, five to 100 foot zone. Uh, and there's some great examples here of, of showing separation of mulched areas um, uh, in some properties here in Sonoma County. The recommendation is to use, choose larger sized wood mulch um, where you do use mulch application in your properties. The picture on the left shows composted wood chips and you wanna make sure you're not using gorilla hair um, on the right that's gorilla hair mulch, which um, tends to be much more fibrous and fine. And this has a picture from FireSafe Marin, and you can see how embers landed in the gorilla hair and can tend to smolder. And the risk is that firefighters may move on to defend another property and the embers could flare up and spread fire to the house. So we covered a lot, <laughs> really fast time frame. Um, here's a quick recap on the Firewise design considerations in the defensible space zone. In your zero to five foot zone, you want to um, use no organic materials if possible. Instead, use inorganic materials such as gravel or stepping stone. In the five to 30 foot zone, you want to plant in islands uh, with materials such as herbaceous perennials, grasses or succulents with some specimen or individual shrubs or trees. Uh, and in same basic principles in the 30 to 100 foot zone, but you can include, include some shrub and tree groupings um, separated by uh, areas that break up the flow of wildfire. Um, ongoing maintenance is essential for a firewise landscape. Uh, particularly with the drought, you will wanna be monitoring trees and shrubs closely and removing any dead or dying branches. Uh, make sure you're pruning out any dead material that can build up from the interior of shrubs if possible. Uh, and I recommend it, uh, prioritizing removal any shrubs under trees, particularly if you're assessing plant removal from a water conservation perspective due to the drought. Uh, it creates an opportunity to create a more firewise landscape and, and reduce and remove any possible ladder fields. So hopefully this has helped give you a framework for assessing your landscape and making it more firewise. Uh, for more information, we have many resources on our web, our website on waterwise and firewise gardening and much, much more, and uh, also a great uh, resource with the Resilient Landscapes Coalition webpage. Uh, here's our webpage link, and um, you are always welcome to send your questions to our Master Gardener Information Desk via the email list. And that is it for me, and I'm going to turn it over to April Owens, who's going to take you through some considerations on um, native plant selections. Fantastic. I just wonder if everybody wants, everybody wants to get up and wiggle around a little bit because we've been talking a lot. So I'm happy to start in a couple minutes. And like, it looks like there's a lot of chat questions. So we will, if, if you guys could put the chat in, the, in, in your questions in the Q&A, that would be wonderful. And then we will try to, to tend these chat questions. And we already have a, a request for uh, more ideas on herbaceous plants. So April, I, I know. Okay. Well, I'm gonna talk about natives <laughs> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to about seven o'clock. So I'm gonna try to like get through this and I'm excited to hear from Jeff as well because we need our, our fire. Um, professionals. So here we go. I am going to share my screen. And Mimi will tell me if I'm sharing the right screen. Looks great. Everything good? Yep, looks good. All right. So um, it's been a pleasure to be a member of this Resilient Landscapes Coalition. Um, I've learned so much. I've expanded my my design business in incredible ways and um 
and I and I'm just excited to show you some of like expand a little further on what Mimi talked about and show some some images and things and please you know get your questions going. So let me just orient myself. So I and my name is April Owens and I am a the founder of the Habitat Corridor Project. And I'm also tightly woven in with the, the local California Native Plant Society chapter, the Milo Baker chapter. So um, we, our mission at the Habitat Corridor Project is to show California plant res restoration gardens in their urban environment. So to show you all how beautiful these plants can be um, as we, sorry, I'm just gonna rant a little bit. Um, so I think a lot of people think that native plants are like messy or unkempt. And so we, we're, our mission is to really show people how the plants can look the best. And then California Native Plant Society, my little Baker chapter, it's just like our mission is to get, get you to use native plants. So back to resilient landscapes. So Resilient landscapes in our world, as, as both John and Mimi so eloquently talked about, is that we are looking at biodiversity, we are looking at drought tolerance, we are looking at um, fire resilience. So it's not just looking at one piece of California. Uh, I think oftentimes we shift to, oh, it's the drought, we're going to just focus on saving water. Oh, it's fires. We're just gonna focus on, on fire resilient landscapes. Oh, it's biodiversity we're lo losing with, with, um, with building. We are just gonna focus on that. So we wanna think about the system thinking, like it's not gonna go away. California has all these things going on. So the first, in the zero to five, so Mimi really outlined our essential um, zones. So zero to five, five to 30, 30 to 100. So if we're thinking about these different, these different areas, we're gonna be looking at zero to five. So zero to five, as Mimi talked about, is like less plants, but I'm gonna like, like add a little bit of fun. So there's some plants you can add to the zero to five. If you are careful about um, keeping some distance and they're they are very well hydrated. So driveways and auto courts are a nice way to, to represent the zero to five area. So this is a landscape in Occidental California. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about areas in Sonoma County, because we are all in Sonoma County. So you can have different different aspects to that zero to five. You can have walls and, um, and permeable hardscape. You can have, in zero to five, you can have a little bit of this well hydrated plants. This is a, this is a wonderful native turf that we've been using a lot. Um, it's called bank grass meadow turf. So this is actually a rollout turf that you can use in your landscape and mow it, um, weed whack it, or not hydrate it in the summer if you're not in the wooey. So it's, an, it's a lovely way to um, create a little green in your zero to five, five to 30. I'm gonna, we're a little wiggly in this space. Uh, another great way to do your zero to five is with some flagstone and some non-natives, which is shocking for me, but I use a little, you know, a few non-natives. We, we use like typically 10% non-natives and Diamondia is one of these wonderful low water use ground covers that works well within, and the zero to five is rated for fire professionals and um, can can provide this like little green in the zero to five. So native turf is a, a is a new opportunity. And so 
this back again, you know, make sure that if you're using the zero to five with native turf, that you're mowing it and keeping it cleaned up in the summer. And you can also use swales and rain gardens in the space, but make sure that you're draining them away from the home. You don't want to have water sinking in in the zero to five. So this is an area that I usually ask for firefighter um, uh, thoughts. And I see Erin is on here. And maybe we can talk about in the question and answer, but this is a landscape in the zero to five that survived the Kincaid fire because the clients were so careful about cleaning up their landscape. The fire whipped around the garden, but these large oak trees over the home were able to provide, um, and they, they also were like super maintained, but they were, they were able to survive the Kincaid fire with these overstory oak trees. I don't know if Erin wants to talk about this. We'll move on and we'll talk about it later because you can have trees over your home. It's just maintain, you mean the vigilant maintenance all year round. So beyond the zero to five, which is rocks and gravel and all kinds of fun things, but five to 30 is where you can have low growing, low fuel seasonal maintenance. So you can have ground covers, you can have um, a mini well hydrated native plants in this zone. You can have pass and swale as separation for the these islands of plants that Mimi talked about. So you can have wonderful high biodiversity plants like monkey flower and buckwheats in these spaces. So it's not that you are in zero to five we're like limiting plant material, but in five to 30, you have an opportunity to have these islands of biodiversity. They just need to be super well-maintained and fire resilient and, and we always think about slowing the fire, slowing the fire from the outside to from the wild land into the home. This is a great place for swales like John talked about or um, or rain gardens. So the five to 30 is a wonderful place to have places for the water to sink in on the landscape. And that, and I love seeing water when it's raining because we don't see that very often. So it's a lovely place to like create these rain gardens and swales with rocks and boulders with the, they create fire breaks, but they also are wonderful places to enjoy the water. And if you're upper Mark West in your region, you're gonna see frogs and lizards and all kinds of wonderful habitat happening there. Again, rain gardens, John showed this photo, but this is a place like people are oftentimes are, are frightened of rain gardens because they think that mosquitoes are gonna, it, the, the water's gonna settle and there's gonna be mosquitoes. And, but um, the, the water sinks down usually so quickly that you don't have any issues with that happening. But you actually get to experience water in California in Sonoma County, which is, it's rare. So design 30 to 100 is our opportunity to have more habitat and larger islands of shrubs with plenty of space in between. So there's all kinds of opportunities to have walls versus flat spaces. So we always talk about like four feet ish, -ish between these islands, but you can use that as a four feet in, in a wall or a, or a or even in pathways, but this is a nice opportunity. Again, um, plants that plants that are wonderful for our Mark West. So this is a Mark West Springs landscape that was burned in the 2017 fire that we brought back some buckwheats. And so you can see outside of the landscape, there's the burnt hillsides that I think this is below your region um, down Red Hill Road, but it's it's still on in your area. And so on the right, we had uh, we planted these native buckwheats 
and then I left quickly. They became this amazing habitat um, garden. And back to the zone. So we're we're in the thirty to a hundred. So these walls and adding native plants and adding um, so salvias and deer grass. There's all kinds of beautiful plants that you can create in masses. So oftentimes we get asked like what we should use between these masses. And typically I use arbor mulch as a landscape designer. Um, so it's composted arbor mulch. So, so if you go into the, to the landscape materials places, if you say I want composted arbor mulch, they're gonna be like, what is that? So arbor mulch typically in the landscape trade is composted arbor mulch. So it has some, it's been it's been heated up to a high um, rate so of so it breaks down the weeds and so you get a mulch that has a lot of uh, dirt and compost and less weeds. There's also you can do, use gravel um, or you can use some some low, water use, well-maintained ground covers like native grasses and um, baccarus or coyote brush or coyote mint. There's a lot of plants you can use in that space. So I'm gonna like slow down a minute because I wanted to show what you can do in the zero to five, 30, five to 30 and 30 to 100. But really I'm here to talk about native plants. So with my little bit of time till 7.05, I want to hear what you guys are using, if, if any of you are using native plants. And I, I miss like in person where we can actually talk about this, but I add to your, to your chat, I'm gonna open my chat. If you are used to native plants, are you using native plants? Are there insects and fauna that you especially love? So please add that to the chat. It'll be exciting to see that. I don't know if I can chat about it, but, um, and in your region, what are native plants that, that work really well for you? So I'm here, I'm here. So, while you're doing that, I'm going to add a biodiversity fact so you can like charm your friends that there are over 1,000 native bees in California that provide critical pollination to our native plants. And 26 of them are the delightful bumblebees. So I, I love bumblebees. And I see some native poppy people in the chat. So bumblebees are so fun. Like you get to like enjoy their little path through the garden and oftentimes on on late Sunday afternoons I love to just sit and watch them bumble around the garden so keep writing what you guys see so I'm going to talk about oh so many so many fun sticky monkey flower um I love native grasses for oak and around my home Dutchman's pipe and the dependent swallowtails that result it's so fun. We, we, we didn't ask, usually we, typically we ask in the beginning of the workshop that um, who was here and where are you from? Um, so since this, is, this was focused on Upper Marquest Springs, we didn't do that, but thank you so much for writing all that. So you know, this is a ground cover, it's lovely, Brad. So keep it coming and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely, we'll be getting in there. So tips for successful, successful habitat planting. So there's, there, so I, I know that we are all like plant lovers, but oftentimes we just like buy one or two of things. So it's really important to create large groupings of plants um, and we call them pollinator targets. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of plant material that we need to use and we can use all over Sonoma County, but these large groupings with many types of flowers and flowering at different times 
and plants that provide both nectar and pollen sources is really important to create these habitat gardens in your landscape. So fun to see all your chat. I'm not gonna get diverted, but I could. Um, I was just gonna talk for a minute about habitat value. I think a lot of people get curious when they're buying plants. So you go into the nursery and you you're wanna buy like a buckwheat, but there's all these different kinds of buckwheat. So ground cover to large shrub cultivars versus species. So, so you can buy um, California fuchsia and buckwheat that are ground covers and giant shrubs. So just like think about how, what, what these plants are, are, are gonna be useful in your garden and make sure you know, and Mimi talked about this too, how big they're gonna get, how tall they're gonna get, what kind of maintenance they're gonna have, really important. So California native shrubs are kind of my passion because they really bring habitat to your garden. So it's really important to get these plants in your landscape. So even in the five to 30, you can have uh, little groupings of shrubs. Like we would say these islands are maybe a lot of low growing native perennials with one toy on or one coffee berry. And then in your five to in your 30 to 100, you have maybe five toy on in a grouping and then some other low growing things. So it's just it's just thinking about the different habitat value of these hedgerows and the groupings of plants. California native shrubs, Ribe sanguinium, California current, current. I'm sure many of you in the Cachete Garden enjoy this, this perennial shrub that's just lovely, blooming in late uh, March, late January, March. So I wanted to talk a little bit about in the shade because I know that some of the landscapes up there are in shade gardens. So um, so I wanted to talk about some of the plants that are really wonderful in the shade, like, and shade and part shade. April, somehow you've gone out of slideshow mode. Slideshow okay. mode. Thank you, thank you. Oops, there you go. Are we back? That's no, back. We're back. So um, hummingbird sage is a great, like low water use, like, but great in swales. Um, spice bush and yerba buena are all plants that can tolerate like dry shade and drought tolerant. So I'm kind of wrapping up with some of my favorite plants that I think that people can just use in all kinds of ranges in Sonoma County. So I call them biodiversity islands and I think that we all, we speak to this island idea and it's not super well grounded, but in the, in the different zones, you can create these biodiversity islands. So you make shrubs with low growing, well-maintained plants and provide space between them. And then you have sun to part shade. So however big these islands are, you can use these different place plants and we'll, we'll be sending out our, um, our slides, so don't don't think you have to like frantically write these down. But these are plants that I find that in Sonoma County are wonderful habitat plants. And so, as I wrap up, I want to talk about irrigation and irrigation with native plants and in our whole ecosystem of California natives and what um, drought tolerance is kind of one of the the big issues. Um, so we're talking like as a resilient landscape, we're talking drought, fire, native plants and irrigation, right? So we talked about drought a little bit. We talked about fire, you know, keeping things well-maintained is super important using the right plants. Native plants are super important for biodiversity and irrigation. So irrigation is a, is a hot topic, I feel like in California. And we can start with, overhead watering with these low water use 
MP rotator heads from Hunter. So you're, you're saturating the soil and, and creating the soil health. But as plants go higher, you have to raise the, the headers and make sure that you're overwatering the garden and making sure that, you know, as shrubs grow. So this, this takes a little light layout, but the plants really do thrive in this space with these, these um, low water use water heads. You can also use a grid of drip. So as you, if you're establishing a garden, this is a wonderful place to, to do a grip of, of irrigation with low water use um, irrigation lines. So you're, but you're still soaking the soil. The importance is soaking the soil as you're planting your plants. And um, it's, it's just really important to think about not just putting little drip irrigation heads to your little plants, but making sure that the soil is saturated. So I'm, I'm a little rushing. No, I'm not. I'm not rushing tonight. So, I mean, my why for creating these landscapes is that we're looking at this future of our children enjoying biodiversity in their landscapes. So um, this is a picture of my son when he was way younger than he is now, but really thinking about what are we planting in our gardens and how are we approaching fire and drought and biodiversity in our landscapes to create this place in the future for our children. So this is our thank you slide um, from the Resilient Landscape Coalition. And hopefully all of you folks are back on soon. Um, so these are our organizations that are a part of this wonderful Resilient Landscape Coalition. And we will send out we will be sending out um, an email with the video recording and PowerPoint slides and a post workout workshop workout workshop survey. So we'd love to hear, hear how we can improve this serve this program. And there's a, your QR code if you're like that. And thank you all for joining. And then April, I think you're turning over to Jeff to wrap up with the last yep. presentation. No, I know, I absolutely. Sorry, I'm sorry. Jeff is going to no, up and talk okay. about Marquess Upper Springs Zone. Okay, thank you, April. Thank you, Mimi. I just got a few minutes here to kind of wrap this up. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'm going to be talking about structural hardening. And I'm going to be Thanks. showing you guys some videos on uh, some fire behavior. We're gonna kind of get into a little bit of fire behavior. Can you guys see my screen okay? See my screen okay? We sure can, Jeff. It looks great. Okay, perfect, That's awesome. Yeah. All right, so let me uh, let me get back to the beginning of this slide here, thanks. Well, you just went out of present mode. Yep. Oh, there you go. Okay, so, okay, so I'm a full-time firefighter, been in the fire service for about 25 years. Um, my first fire that I fought was in the Oakland Hills fire uh, when I was in high school, and that kind of put me on this trajectory to get in the fire service. So over the last 20 years, the increase in fire behavior, an increase of destruction, and uh, that is what caused me to start the company Fireline Mitigation. And I go throughout the state helping specifically uh, wineries and large estates in creating defensible space and structural hardening plans. And I help them to secure insurance and try to avoid the fair plan, which is not the greatest option, but sometimes there's no other option. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, we're gonna be talking about fire behavior and structural hardening. Kind of going to be building on a little bit of what April and Mimi and John have talked about. Redundancy is good in this topic. So fuel, weather, and topography. This is what dictates fire behavior. Obviously, um, weather has been the biggest component in Sonoma County. We have not had a large conflagration in Sonoma or Napa County that didn't have a wind component to it. So a red flag warning today has a much different meaning than it did before the Tubbs fire. So I think all of us now, when we are being bombarded with PSPSs and uh, red flag warnings, everyone has become a lot more educated on the weather and on fire behavior. 
So if there's not a wind component, I'm not as concerned. Usually as firefighters, we can go direct, we can have better um, resources that are more efficient with the aerial resources, the helicopters, the planes, um, but, but all of that is really hard uh, when, when we have the wind component. One thing that I, that I wanna add, and I wanna encourage everybody, it's the small things that make a really big difference when it comes to helping your home survive from embers, which is, as John said, and, and also Mimi and April said, that, that, that embers is the biggest uh, reason that we lose structures, but it's the small things that make a big difference. So hopefully at the end of my small presentation, you'll be empowered with a little bit more education on things that you can do around your home to help harden it. So this first video is, uh, just to show a little bit of fire behavior, this is during the LNU complex. This was a small fire called the Stewart's Fire that we were initial attack on and it burned into the Wallbridge Fire. So this is just above Lake Sonoma and you'll be able to see uh, kind of embers, direct flame impingement, radiant heat. This is a mid slope road here. So you see the trees moving from the convected heat column that's my wife, Jen. We were trying to scout where this fire uh, was going to go, and we drove a couple miles down this fire road and found it. So this next video, it was a couple hours later, and this is when the fire impacted the top of um, above Lake Sonoma um, and uh, a winery called Gustafson Winery. And kind of the key point here is you're gonna have a really good visual representation of fire brands, embers, direct flame impingement and radiant heat. But this, this winery received no damage because of the zero to five foot zone where they instituted some of the things that April and Mimi and John have been talking about, their structural hardening. And so watch this video and you can see how extreme the fire behavior was and their building did not receive any of the damage. So you can hear the wind, you can see the fire brands, extreme fire behavior. And uh, we were in a safe spot. We were in a parking lot so we can make a stand here. So it just kind of shows you that with proper construction techniques and um, good defensible space, that even when you have a, a major fire front come through that your home can, can make it. Um, what we found is that a lot of times we're losing structures to six, eight, 10 inch flame lengths after the main fire front comes through and you have all of this vegetation and mulch and um, uh, lack of structural hardening. You don't have the right vents on your house. So when it comes to vents, we're looking for eighth inch mesh screening. Uh, there's some vents that have been tested by science called the Vulcan vent and the Brand Guard vent. Those are two vents that prevent ember intrusion. Uh, so like it was mentioned earlier, the three main reasons we lose structures is embers, direct flame impingement and radiant heat. So we deal with embers through structural hardening. We deal with direct flame impingement and radiant heat through defensible space. The quality of the defensible space and structural integrity define the home ignition zone. So this next video is um, from the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, and it's their ember generator. And it just shows you that this is, this is the science that backs why homes are lost in the wildland urban interface due to conflagrations. Um, and on a sidebar, when we have these fires come through, CAL FIRE sends out these teams, they're called DENS teams, and they assess structures to find out why they were damaged so that we can have data to back up what we're saying tonight for you guys to do. So we'll watch this quick 30 second video.
can see the zero to five foot zone, obviously wood shake siding. You can see the pocket there, how it does trap debris on the inside there. Um, just a good visual representation of, of, of home being lost to uh, two embers. And so here's just the photo kind of, kind of reiterating the direct flame contact, ember transport and uh, radiant heat. So when I'm ass assessing structures, uh, we always start at the roof. It's the biggest area that's most susceptible to embers. And the gold standard it has is to have a class A rated roof. Um, to get that rating, there's testing that's involved. It involves a um, 12 inch brick of dug fir and there can't be any slipping of the um, roof. Like so for a comp, for a um, asphalt comp roof, you can't have that any slipping and you also can't have any burn through or embers casted from the roof. So it's a scientific test to get that rating. So in California, that's what the gold standard is a class A rated roof. And then I go down to the gutters and I look at the gutters. Um, usually we're recommending that you put non-combustible gutter guards in, but the main goal is that you have um, no material in there. Some of the wineries opt to just have a high maintenance schedule where they have guys up there and gals up there blowing the gutters out. That's um, not easy for everybody to do. So gutter guards are a good option. And it, it, I want to reiterate the fact that everything requires maintenance. So even with gutter guards, it still requires maintenance. I'm in my backyard right now and I, I can see some debris on top of my um, gutter guards. And then we're looking at the eaves and the soffits. And uh, I'll have a better picture to kind of depict what boxed in um, means. Site, and then we transition to the siding. We want to look at the condition of the siding. If it is non-combustible, that has fresh paint, no dry rot. And then um, the windows, we uh, suggest dual pane tempered glass. And the reason why windows break due to radiant heat is because the temperature differentiation between the two panes of glass causes the windows to be compromised. Um, all the way down to garage door weather stripping and then heat pockets was kind of like that video uh, showed that kind of like the inside corners is I think it was mentioned earlier. And so when we look at the roofs, they're simple and complex roofs. On the left here, you can see a simple uh, hip roof and it doesn't have a lot of areas for debris to be caught in the roof. Simple form versus uh, the slide here down here, you have more complicated, you have the dormers. And um, so when you get debris that kind of gets up against the siding, that's when we start to have issues. So I'm gonna transition out of this here really quick. And I'm gonna show you guys a, a video that uh, before I do that, I'll show you this photo. This is a photo I took right when the glass fire started. This is the worst case scenario that firefighters have. This is an hour into the glass fire taken from Silverado Trail. And this is when the ladder fuels get up into the canopy and we have a running crown fire. So this is just a good depiction of extreme fire behavior. And during these conditions, we can have fire spot up to a mile to two mile of, of itself. When I was fighting the Caldor fire up in Tahoe, we had a uh, spot that was four miles. So I've never heard that or seen that before. So here's just a video that I created to kind of help um, nail down some of the points that we're talking about. Think of your home as a submarine, right? Now, you don't want to have any holes inside of a submarine that allows water to enter. The same with embers. And that analogy was given to me from a friend of mine. And so can water enter our home? Can can embers enter our home? And so when I do assessments, I use a drone. We check the aerial perspective. It's always interesting to see the fuel continuity from an aerial perspective. And uh, then we come down to the roof. This is a very complex roof, obviously non-combustible siding, uh, dual pane windows, but even tile roofs like this have a weakness. And I'm always looking for the weakness in the structure. And so usually the weakness here can be uh, lack of gutter guards and debris in the gutters, but mainly bur uh, bird stopping. This next slide I think is gonna show what um, here, right here, the holes underneath there. If you don't have bird stopping here, that, that birds can in, get in there and make nests and it's a perfect space for embers to come in and cause, cause issues. Uh, obviously gutter 
um, people can't see. That's what's the benefit of having the drone to kind of get up there and help residents and um, wineries see what the debris that's in their gutters. A lot of times in Sonoma County, we're blessed with beautiful sunshine. And so people have shade cloths attached to their um, structures. And this is flammable. We don't wanna have this attached to our structures. Obviously we wanna remove all vegetation, wanna have dual pane windows. Um, and th that it can, be, it can be expensive. Thankfully, Sonoma County is starting to come out with some grants to help people with structural hardening. Um, there's other better material than wood lattice to have in the zero to five foot zone. And then also, it was mentioned earlier, gates. Uh, during the glass fire, I cut my fence off when I was eva I've evacuated my house three times, but I cut the fence off because um, it was combustible. Now it's all metal. Um, we want to make sure we have no debris underneath decks and to uh, have the grass mowed down. And this is all stuff that we want to do in the winter time. And so I kind of have a saying now, we fight fire in the winter time. I'm tired of seeing destruction. I'm, I'm tired of having to call people saying that they've lost everything. And so that's why I have kind of transitioned to trying to help people harden their structures. But in the winter time is when we really make a big difference. So let me transition back to um, our slides here. So this is the picture I was going to talk about the eaves and the soffits. And we found through science that um, having boxed in eaves is uh, really helps with the heat from getting up into um, this. So this is a kind of picture here where it is boxed in, prevents um, the radiant heat and embers from getting up into the vents and the hot air and gases are deflected out and away from the building. So this is a video and just to kind of show, uh, this is from a friend of mine up, up the hill from us. This is during the glass fire. We couldn't get fire engines up here, but my wife and I were able to get in here with a pickup truck. They had really good defensible space. It was a, sh a shaded fuel break, good, um, not a lot of brush around their home. The main fire front has come through, but you're gonna see that there's a lot of fire around and there is some leaves and they could have lost their home to a five inch flame length. But we were able to save it with their garden hose and a lot of the work that they have already done. And this last video is uh, from um, uh, Skyhawk during the glass fire, just showing ember casting, pretty dramatic ember cast and wind into uh, the wildland urban interface. So that kind of ends my presentation because I, I feel like we haven't, there's the questions are stacking up here and I, I really want to make sure everybody gets their questions answered. And um, that's it. I'll turn it back over to uh, Mimi. You're not muted. <laughs> <laughs> that was phenomenal, Jeff. And there's nothing like our firefighters' direct experience and videos from those events to really help inform uh, what the reality is during the wildfire. So thank you for that. That was spectacular. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we wanted to try to tackle some of the questions. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to all of them. We, we are wrapping by 7.30. Um, uh, hopefully April and Ellie are, are off video because they're helping type in some questions and responses, <clears throat> but I wanted to start. There's a couple of themes that emerged that I thought we could discuss first to address some of the questions. And then Jeff, there's some, I think specifically that, that might uh, go towards you from a firefighter's perspective. So um, phenomenal comment from um, Katie um, saying she's working on her zero zone, right on Katie. She's removed all the vegetation and the flammable material, but struggling with hardscape retrofit. And um, are there, do we have suggestions for good resources? And another uh, comment later on about what's the best place to see photo examples of aesthetically pleasing hardscaping and non-combustible gates and fences. Where can we get inspired? That's something that we as a coalition have been um, actively discussing. We're actually in discussions with colleagues in Marin County. And we're starting up uh, an initiative to work with a professional photographer to start capturing images for you all. So you can see ideas and generate ideas for implementing um, some of the things that we've been recommending um, in your home landscapes. Roberta, did you have a comment? Yeah, regarding that, um, a good way to, to be inspired with something like that is if you Google hardscape or pavers, 
And when you go to the top of your Google Choices, select Images. If you did that right now, Google Pavers or Hardscape, either one, go up to the top of the Google Tools, click Images, and you'll get a plethora of inspiring images related to those things, whether it's Pavers or, or Hardscape. Um, it, it'll, it'll really be inspirational. Awesome. Thank you for that, Robert. And I wanted to cut, hit one other theme before I turn to some questions that um, that I think Jeff's most appropriate to answer. So um, one of the attendees says, I'm, I'm really confused. Mimi's saying scientific research supports no plants in zero to five. April's showing some plants in that zone. What is the recommendation for the Mark West watershed specifically? And I want to say, and um, what I present is like your optimal best of all worlds. A lot of people are not going to find it acceptable to do absolutely no vegetation in the zero to five. There are, um, you know, you do want to do your own risk assessment and, and both John and I tried to speak to that. Are you in a very fire, high fire severity zone? Are you directly abutting Wui? Um, you know, what is the fire history in your community or neighborhood? Um, uh, give it, are you on a, on a slope? Um, given those, yeah, I'd be implementing zero to five pretty religiously. That could look like gravel or concrete, or it could look like a low ground cover like that Diamondia ground cover with, um, with uh, flagstone stepping stones that April showed in one of her graphics. But you wanna make sure what you're creating there is not creating a place for embers to be captured. So I don't know, Jeff, do you wanna add on to that? Yeah, just really quickly. I, I wanna to touch base that we in the Mark West, 80% of us are not in the wildland urban interface. We're in the forest. The wildland urban interface is where you have a clear demarcation between um, the city and where the forest and trees come down, like Skyhawk down in, in, in the Rincon Valley area. We're in the forest here. And so I think maybe that you did a good job of um, kind of putting the thought process through there. It's like, what's the slope? What's the topography? Am I in a drainage? Do I have fire history? We all have fire history up here. So I tend to be more conservative. At the same time, I think April brings a fresh perspective to things that we can do to give us some liberty in that area. It all comes down to maintenance. It all comes down to selection. And I think if you were to follow Mimi or April's recommendations as far as not having it near events, and, and you know, if you have a non-combustible siting, then we might give and take a little bit, but yeah. There's just a little bit of, of I, I was just showing a little bit of, of um, opportunity because people are are have a hard time with just zero to five being nothing green and so there are a, there just a few things you could add so jeff can we turn to some that i think are more specific to you from your firefighting experience so brad stewart asked can you talk about established redwoods 30 feet from the house yes slim them up but how do they perform in a wind-driven canopy fire uh, that's a great question. So uh, the redwood trees, it, it, it comes down to the maintenance. What we have found is that when you have trees that are 120 feet away from the structure, uh, that you're not going to have damage to the structure from radiant heat. Now, that being said, usually we have a wind component and your trees are 30 feet uh, from your structure. So my suggestion would be to remove ladder fuels, just to reiterate, that's all the brush and everything that's, that's underneath it. I think we had some slides that talked about tree separation in that zone. Um, some zero to 30, you want 18 foot of separation between the tree canopy, 30 to 60, 12 feet, 60 to 100, six feet. So it's a sliding scale. That doesn't necessarily take in the slope, the aspect, the topography, the history. Um, fire line mitigation, I can come out and help you out, so. <laughs> <laughs> can you, there's kind of a couple slightly relevant questions along that same thread. Um, Brad also said, some say well hydrated Japanese maples may be ember catchers. Can you, do you have an opinion on trees being possible ember catchers? That's, yeah, that's yeah, you know, um, I, 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 as far as ember casters, there's ones that I know off the top of, like right off the cuff and wineries love them. And, and that's the Italian cypresses. Just because when I, and when I'm assessing a tree for its vulnerability, 
Um, I'm looking at the continuity of the fuel, its ability to hold dead wood on the interior. So those Italian cypresses, we call them in the fire service Roman candles. They look green and live on the outside, but they're super dense and they have a lot of dead fuel on the interior. Um, when I think of a uh, Japanese uh, maple, is that, what he, he, that, is that the tree he was talking about? Yes, yes, they're sir. more open, they're more aerated. That's not something that comes to my mind is something that's a huge issue. Yeah, and it's not going to have that dead debris build up. You might want to clean up dead dead twigs or branches that might develop. I was just doing that on a Japanese maple that's in my five to 30 foot zone uh, just last weekend. Um, but if it's well hydrated, well maintained, um, it, it should be less of a threat. There's another question I'm hoping the whole panel can speak to April, Ellie, John, and, and Jeff as well. Um, Peggy asked about oaks. Um, her resident scrub jay is planting oak seedlings all over her yard. Um, uh, she's got 12, two 12 foot oaks on the property um, and the 12 footers are six feet apart from each other and about 10 feet from the home. Is it her job to decide which of these survive or do I let it all go on its own way? Jeff, do you wanna weigh in that on in April and Ellie? I'll let you guys go if you want me. <laughs> So the, so the specific questions about the oak sucklings, is that what I understand? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like Ellie, do you want to start with that? Or I feel like I could speak to it too. Well, the, you know, we, the, our team debates this subject all the time um, about, you know, clusters of trees. I know, um, and I think perhaps this is maybe one area that that we, you know, we the reason we debate is that we have different ideas about it. Now, if 10 feet from your home, two oaks that are young oaks that are six feet apart, um, you know, you may you may want to be the executioner and, and remove one of them. On the other hand, you could think of them if they're six feet apart as being kind of like one tree. And um, and you could you know prune it up and just take really good care of it. On the other hand, they can you know one can overtop the other and shade it out and then make it unhealthy. Um, and that in that case, you would want to remove it. So you know it might be a good idea to pick the one that looks the strongest and healthiest and um, and remove the other one because later on it will be more expensive and and you know and maybe more difficult to remove. Um, I, I think having having one or possibly two 10 feet from the house doesn't have to be a problem as long as you keep take really good care of the trees and and as they get older, make sure you remove the debris that falls. And um, I, you know, I have two oaks that are six feet apart. No, they're 10 feet apart. I'm looking at it right now, but they are like three feet from my barn. <laughs> And uh, I took a really long time and now I'm, you know, I waited too long and the one that's this weaker is going to have to go. So anybody else? Yeah, I would say that you're committing to the ongoing maintenance. As John said, oaks are one of like a keystone species, incredibly important for habitat support. You just have to know that you're, um, you're supporting that, but also stepping up for the maintenance is going to be required on an ongoing basis for any debris that drops. My quick perspective would be this on my sort of normal residential community lot. We don't actually have any oak trees, but every winter, I think hundreds of oak seedlings come up from um, plantings from jays and squirrels and so forth from neighbors trees. Uh, there's absolutely no way we could allow all of that. In fact, we don't uh, have really have room for an oak tree. But if I decided that um, that one was appropriate, uh, no doubt there would be a seedling in the right place within a year or two, and I would uh, you know, so I need to play the role of a uh, decision maker in that case and choose, you know, if any and, and which oak seedlings would uh, would remain. And, and just to add to John saying what I, I said, you know, if you do remove one of them that is perhaps less robust, you know, you, you would potentially be offering those resources to the other tree, which then might actually uh, become even stronger over time. They do. I mean, they get big. I don't know what kind, what species of oak it is, but you know, those are all things to think about. Can we turn, Jeff? There's some specific questions I want to make sure that we have you address. Um, Chris Peterson asks if you have a pool or pond, a fire pump fittings and fire return at like thermogel or bare capable firefighters use it. Yes. That was an easy answer. <laughs> yeah. So um, the 
what's what 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 I recommend to people um, during my assessments. We also teach people on what to do during red flag warnings, evacuation warnings, and um, evacuation orders. And like I said earlier, uh, sometimes people stay behind. Usually we we don't advise that, but usually with wineries that have good defensible space, parking lots, they're safe. And so we can't expect to always get an engine, um, but when you have those types of resources, it's good to pull them out and actually see if you can get a draft, put it into your pool, into your pond and run some drills because when the fire's coming down, that's not the time to make sure that it has fuel and that it starts. Okay, and another one can you from Katie, can you talk more about radiant heat mm -hmm. ignition? Uh, my wooey home is in a subdivision. Oh, mm -hmm. oh sure. Kelly? I just wanted to, I, 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 there was a question about coyote brush and I, I mean, I, we, we can, we only have like three or four more minutes and I, 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 sure. I want to leave, I'll let you decide, but, but I didn't nope, want to. I was going to go there next, but go for it. That opportunity. So I just uh, address that like right directly, but you can, you should talk about coyote brush. Yep. That'd be great. Um, well, just like any plant that, that has a bad name, manzanita is another one. Um, in, in general, and I've been, I've been following the FireSafe Marin, which, which has a very um, thorough website about, and, and, and they, have, they actually have the list of, of problem plants, and Coyote Brush does show up on the list of problem plants, and they say it takes a lot of maintenance. And, you know, and just like many of the plants, we're describing the, the herbaceous perennials, it would need to be cut back. I have ground cover coyote brush and I'm, I cut it back every two or three years to keep it fresh. And that's true of just about any plant that you're going to have in your garden. Coyote brush is a, a tremendous uh, plant for um, insects and biodiversity. That we recommend you have to maintain it. Uh, what I will say, and I've told Roberta McIntyre this many times, is that what you need to do for maintenance in a native garden is a lot less than what you have to do for maintenance on your um, on your lawn. You know, you don't have to go out once a week and, and mow it or irrigate it. Um, once or twice a year, you need to clean it up. That's what I have to say about coyote brush. <laughs> Thank you, LA. And then Jeff, did you um, did you see the question from Katie about? I, I did. I, I did. I just sent her my phone number. And um, so she could get a hold of me, but basically really quick, that's a tough scenario. So she's, she's in more of a subdivision. She's concerned about the radiant heat from a homeowner that um, does not maintain their home. So what I usually say in this scenario is control what you can, and that's your property. So do everything you can within your property. A lot of times we'll have transition from one home to another because of wooden fences and debris. A lot of times, I'm not saying this, Katie, this is your scenario, but a lot of times people are pointing at their neighbors and they got gutters full of, of debris. So shore up your property, do what you can. And then, um, you know, sometimes you can't talk to neighbors just because of, of the, the dynamic that it is. Um, but that's always a question that I get. And it's, it, it's a tough scenario. 35 feet away is not five feet. So that's better than, you know, a subdivision down in Coffee Park. I hope that answers your question. That was a really phenomenal note to end on. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, and the, the cats question about birds and cats. Oh, I was I was just typing that, but um, because I know it's almost time. Um, yeah, cats are the 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 greatest cause of bird mortality. Um, and in the United States, and I I have a cat. Um, I let her outside for an hour or so a day. I, I monitor her because she's very fast. I have uh, had, I have caused her to release birds. Um, it's, you know, it, it, yeah, I, I, I never had cats until a friend of mine gave me a cat. And I, it's, I have friends who are bird, major bird enthusiasts and they let their cats go out for a couple of hours in the evening, you know, but most people will tell you, just keep your cats inside. Don't get them used to being outside because then they'll want to be outside all the time, but they'll be perfectly happy inside. Um, and I have, my cat is, is supposed to be a gopher and mole cat, but you know, when she started catching birds, I, I, I changed her her role <laughs> so, as yeah. my cat comes 
creepsing but... <laughs> That's awesome. He wants to the workshop with his tail. <laughs> so if you if you have if you have moles and gophers and that was what you wanted your cat for, you know, you can put up owl boxes. Barn owls are terrific source of, you know, creatures that will that will go and and do that. And I, you know, and the when my old cat anyway, that's another story, but but I have many 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 more red tail hawks and um and owls in my neighborhood since the when the cats started moving away. Aaron or Jeff, do you want to close this up? We're at time at 7.30. Any parting comments? Yeah, for, um, go yeah. Ahead. I'll just say really quickly, um, when we come in as firefighters, there's, there's uh, I'm gonna have some part with some harsh words that we say, um, just because we're risking our lives that when we're coming in. And there's a saying that I, I teach our younger recruits and it's, if you don't care, I don't care. And it's not the time for me to be doing general maintenance when the fire front's coming through. A lot of times during these conflagrations, we're just trying to make sure people are out of their homes. So stay tuned into Nixle, stay tuned into the weather, do the small things, take care of your neighbors, fight fire in the winter by, by instituting the design practices. And that's all I have to say. All right, well, as on behalf of the land- I love that fight fire in the winter. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great one. Thank you all for joining us. So sorry for the timing snafu miscommunication. We really appreciate you guys hanging in with us. Hope it was of value. You'll see an email follow up with us with a recording and a copy of the slides and hope you'll participate in a uh, um, survey that'll come out in a couple of weeks so we can know how to improve and, and really appreciate all your time and attention and, and hope there was some value for you in tonight's session. Thank you for your time. Good night. Thanks, Thanks so much, everybody. everybody. Have a good night.